Growing up outside of Philadelphia, one of my favorite things to do was go to the local 7-Eleven, as my siblings and I would call it, the set, and we would get a super big gulp and a pretzel. I love soft pretzels. They're probably one of my favorite foods. Uh, I, we would go there almost every day. When we were in Philadelphia for my brother's wedding, we went and we would get pretzels all the time. In fact, on our wedding day, before we headed off to the, uh, where we were gonna get married, we stopped at a 7-Eleven and we went in and of course got some soft pretzels because they are just so good. They're best when they're warm, straight out of the oven, or uh, salty, especially salt. They gotta be full of salt because that's what makes them really good. Now, also growing up, I would go, we'd go to 7-Eleven, we would go and get a bagel. Now, there we, they would get a bagel and they would slice it in half and put this big chunk of cream cheese in it. And I would go get that before I would go to like my job and have a nice breakfast. And then when I lived in DC, I lived in DC for a semester in college and as any poor college student, they, didn't get much to eat, but I would be able to find bagels almost everywhere. That would be a great way to keep my dietary, you know, just going. Then I discovered probably one of the greatest inventions, here it is, the salt bagel. It's a great bridge between a soft pretzel and a bagel, just delicious saltiness, but also that, that beautiful taste of a, uh, of a bagel. Now, when I lived, uh, uh, when we moved to San Antonio, my wife introduced me to something also just as good. Nice, warm, fresh, fresh baked flour tortillas. Now, you don't get them really here very often, but almost every Mexican restaurant and many other restaurants would serve fresh flour tortillas. And you would go there and just like they would put chips on your, on your table, they would also give you these this basket full of warm tortillas. You could dip it in salsa, you could uh, make a taco out of it, you could just eat it plain, put some butter on it. And if you wanted a dessert, you could sprinkle some sugar on it. And those are so good. I know that's one of the things Dawn misses the most about being in Texas, is those beautiful tortillas. I see, today we're talking about Jesus being the bread of life. I gotta get my little clicker here, right? It says, I am the bread of life. And we're doing this, this series about I am, and Jesus giving these various I am statements. And Jesus, last week we looked at him saying, I am he, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ. And so today we're looking at I am the bread of life. So before I continue, just turn to someone right next to you and you tell them one of your favorite types of bread. Go ahead, tell somebody, share with them your favorite bread. Yeah. All right, now that you all are good and hungry, let's move on. Jesus says in John 6 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He says, I am the bread of life. I am that sustenance, that nourishment, that essential food that you need to get through life. It is a powerful and audacious statement. And it's throughout John chapter 6, he talks about what it means for him to be the bread of life. And kind of to get our an understanding of what Jesus is saying, there's a couple of things we need to understand. First, he gives this statement. He says, I am the bread of life the day after he feeds the 5,000. And if you're familiar with that story, we know that Jesus was out in kind of in the middle of nowhere. He was teaching to this, this large group of people. They said there was about 5,000 men and maybe, and there was also women and children, roughly between 10 to 20,000 people. They were kind of out in the middle of nowhere. They, they were, it was getting late and they didn't want to send people away on an empty stomach. And so they decided they needed to feed the people. But all they had was five small loaves of bread and two small fish. And somehow Jesus then takes that bread and that fish and he, he begins to break it and multiply it and begins to share that food with everyone. Fish sandwiches all around. And eventually they, everyone eats to have their full and then the disciples collect the leftovers and there's 12 baskets, one basket for each disciple to take with them. 
And so then the next day, Jesus has crossed over the lake, and the people go and they look for Jesus and they find him. And Jesus says to them, This is you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. In other words, you were coming here because I gave you a free meal yesterday. That's why you're here. And of course, they try to object and say, No, we're not. But Think about it. If someone's giving away a free meal, of course you're going to want to show up. I know I would. And so they are, um, but then Jesus tries to explain to him how he is the bread of life. And they're trying to, and they ask him, Jesus, we need you to prove to us. Prove to us that you are God. And they try to bring about the story that happened about 1,300 years earlier when God gave manna to the people as they were wandering in the wilderness. They, they asked Jesus, what sign then will you give us uh, that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors gave the manna in the wilderness. And so they want Jesus to prove that he is who he is, that he is from God. And so he, they talk about the story of Moses and the people in the wilderness. They had been free from Egypt they had gone out with these miraculous acts, these ten plagues, with the, the Red Sea splitting and the people walking across on dry land. They get to Mount Sinai and they, they get the, the Ten Commandments. And then they start wandering through the wilderness. And they get restless and anxious and aren't sure what to do. And they forget God's provisions and the way that God has cared for them. And it says in Exodus 16 that in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. They're so fed up that they want to just die there. They said that in Egypt, they sat around pots of meat and ate food, all the food they wanted. And you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So they're, they're complaining they don't have the food that they had back in Egypt. And they want Moses, they're, they're just out to get Moses, thinking he led them out there. And so it says that the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. He's saying, I'm going to provide for you this miraculous bread from heaven for you. And this is what it looked like. It's kind of interesting. It says that when the dew was gone, so every morning when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. So this was this bread that just kind of appeared on the ground after the dew. It says, Moses said, this is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. And so for 40 years, the Israelites ate this man as they wandered through the wilderness. This is the, the meals that God provided for them. And each morning they would go out and they would collect that food and they would uh, gather enough for each day. And this is the, the bread of heaven that the, the Jewish people are, are talking to Jesus about. They're saying that Moses gave the people of Israel back as they were wandering through this bread from heaven as a sign. Of course, Jesus, he corrects them and he says, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is the Father who gives you true bread from heaven. So these, these two stories are kind of paint the backdrop for this uh, conversation that Jesus is having with his people. But also, there's this foreshadowing that happens. There's something we also need to look at, this foreshadowing that Jesus says later. Time. He says, uh, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And this is going to be a, maybe a confusing or disgusting thing that the people as listening would be trying to understand what Jesus is getting at. But I can imagine John. John, as he's thinking about writing down what Jesus is saying and writing down this event, how his mind would go to that first, that Passover meal, that night where he, Jesus and his disciples were sharing the Passover meal together. And when Jesus, he says that the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said that this 
is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he would take the cup. And he said, this is the new, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And John would remember that night and all that had transpired after that. But then he would remember how Jesus said that whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he would remember how the people of God, the Jesus followers, would gather day, all the time to meet with each other. And they would share the Lord's Supper together. They would just partake in communion together. Where they would share the bread and share the cup. And they would remember what Jesus has done. They would eat his flesh and drink his blood and remember the sacrifice that he made. Now, if I'd been wiser, maybe planned it out better, I would have probably scheduled this sermon for a communion Sunday, but I'm just going to enjoy it anyway. And so, as we look at the story, Jesus proclaiming, I am the bread of life, it helps us understanding all these, helps us have a better background or better understanding of what Jesus is saying. Now, this passage you know, it's a, it's a big chunk of scripture, right? We're going from John 6, verses like 25 to like 70. And so instead of reading the whole thing, you're kind of, I'm going to show it as what would the conversation be between Jesus and the crowd? So we've got the crowd saying, hey, Jesus, um, when did you get here? Oh, um, I see you're looking for me because I gave you food yesterday. What? We have, we have no idea what you're talking about, Jesus. Well, you know, I, I fed the 5,000 men and the women and children, too. Out with the five small loaves and the two small fish. No, that's not what we want you. We just, uh, we're just here to listen to you. But if you do have some food, hmm, hmm. there is food that you work for, which spoils. But then there's food that endures, that comes from me. Okay, well, give us that food that endures. The food that endures is simply to believe in me. Okay, well, give us a sign that you're from God. You know, like Moses did. He gave our ancestors manna, bread from heaven. <coughs> Actually, I think the manna was from God, my Father, who offers you the true bread of life from heaven which comes down and gives life to the world. Ooh, give us some of that bread. That sounds good. I am the bread of life. Come to me and never go hungry. <coughs> Believe in me and never go thirsty. Wait, wait. Um, but we know you. You're, you're just Jesus, the, the son of Joseph. You're not the bread of life. I don't think so. I have come down from heaven to do my Father's will. And my Father's will is that everyone comes to me and believes and will have eternal life. Wait, how can you say you came down from heaven? We know you're, you're like from Nazareth. I'm here to do the will of my Father. If you believe in me, you will have eternal life. Those who ate the manna are dead. They died in the wilderness. I am the bread of life. Eat this bread and live forever. My bread, or the bread is my flesh, and I give my life for the world. Wait, what? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life. My flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. So you want us to eat your flesh and drink blood? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Those who ate the manna are dead, but whoever feeds on me will live forever. Okay, I think you've lost me. This is really confusing. So are, are you offended by what I say? What I've said is from the Holy Spirit, and it brings life. But there are some who will never believe it. 
Yeah, I think I'm one of them. I'm, I'm out of here. This is too confusing. There we go. Let's see. So here Jesus is declaring to the people, I am the bread of life. But why bread? What is so important about bread? Why not the pretzel of life, right? Or the, the bagel of life? You know, why not something delicious like I am the, the cake of life? Or this big old donut of life? Or donut holes of life? You know, something delicious, something that would talk about the, the richness and decadence of the grace of Christ. Here I'm going to rely on Daryl Johnson who writes, Jesus doesn't say, I am the cake of life. He could say that because it's delicious, and because he is delicious in every way. But he doesn't say that because we can make it without cake. We simply cannot make it without bread. Cake is a luxury. Jesus is saying, I am not a luxury. I am absolutely essential for human existence. Because bread is a staple. It's something all people need. People of different forms, different cultures, all have bread. And Jesus is saying that that is what we need. We need him. We need him even more than we need bread. We need him more than we need our next meal. That Jesus is essential. He is essential for true life. And perhaps we want the whoopie pie, right? We would want to come with a whoopie pie or uh, donuts or, or Kringle or whatever. And we go to these things. We think these things are going to satisfy us. This, this big donut's going to satisfy me more than you know, a loaf of bread. And we think there are things in our lives that are going to satisfy us more than Jesus. We go to our work. We work hard. We think our jobs are going to satisfy us. They're going to give us that meaning we, we want in life. But we go through our jobs and we still feel like there's something missing in life. And so then we think, well, when I'm done with my job, when I'm retired, life will be great. I will find my meaning and purpose and I'll be able to do whatever we want. So we retire and we still feel like there's, there's something not quite there something that we're missing in life. We think maybe money will have it. Maybe if we just get more money, then we can buy things, we can have stuff, we can have all these things and these possessions that we have will fill the void in our souls. And we realize that the more that we acquire, the less we feel like we were, there's still something there, there's still something missing in our lives. And we think, well, what about physical pleasures, things that make me feel good? If we rely on that, we, we just live our lives to, to seek out the things that make us feel good, then that will give us meaning. We go through those things and we still feel empty. And we think, well, maybe now, uh, that's why people turn to things like drugs and alcohol and food and addictions and things that will try to fill that void in their lives. And yet there's, there's still that thing that's missing and they can't seem to escape and find it. And people even turn to even good things like relationships, like family and marriage and friendships. And these are all great things. But if we're seeking our meaning in our, our families and our friendships and our relationships, there's still something that is missing. And not all these things are bad, but they don't truly satisfy us. They don't give us the spiritual nourishment that we need. They still leave us hungry and empty, that none of these things that we try to fill our souls with will ever satisfy. We were created by God with this thing that needs to be filled by Him. And we can only be truly satisfied. We can find only true nourishment in Jesus. Or as Daryl Johnson says, our infinite soul or our finite soul can, can only be satisfied with the infinite I am. So my question for you is, what are you trying to fill your soul with? What are you trying to eat? What is your donut or your whoopie pie or your donut holes or things that you are trying to give yourself meaning, trying to take on? How are those things leaving you feeling malnourished and empty and bloated? Jesus says, I am the bread of 
of life. I am the bread of life. Uh, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever uh, believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, many of us, if you're like me, will think, okay, I'll just take a nibble of Jesus, a little bit of Jesus here, and then I'll, I'll feast on, you know, my donut holes and my, my pretzels and my cake, and that, should, that little bit of Jesus should fill me up for the rest of the day, but it doesn't. We think that little bite isn't going to, to fill us up. What we need to understand is that what Jesus is saying is not you come to me one time and you will never be hungry. Because that's what it, how it looks like. Oh, we just come to him that one time, we'll never be hungry. Yet I still feel hungry. Or I come to him, I believe in him, and I'll never be thirsty, but I still feel thirsty. And so how can we reconcile this? What we need to understand is these, these verbs here, these verbs of come and the word believe, it's not a one-time act. In, in the Greek, what it, it means is it's a continual action, that you are to keep coming to Jesus, that you're continually believing in him. You're, it's a, uh, something you keep doing day by day, moment by moment, that you are looking to him to fill your soul, to, to find nourishment in him, to continually come to him instead of the donut holes and the whoopie pies and things like that. You see, we get that picture from the people who are wandering in the wilderness. Each morning, they had to go out and collect manna. They were only allowed to collect what was needed for the day. Because if they kept some, if they thought, oh, I'll just keep some extra, and then in the morning we'd wake up and it would be moldy and maggot filled and just disgusting. So God had designed it so it, it could only go out to a day, that day and get it. And that's how it is with us. We need to continually come to God day by day, come to Jesus and, and come to the bread of life and find that true nourishment. It's a continual act. It's something we are called to do over and over again so that we will not be hungry. The story ends with people being kind of disgusted by what Jesus said, deserting him, leaving him. They say they found his teaching to be too difficult. It was too difficult, so they were going to leave. Now, we would think maybe it's too difficult for them to, to understand. Because he's talking about his, his body and his blood and his flesh and all this stuff. But it wasn't that it was too difficult for them to understand. It was too difficult for them to accept. Too difficult for them to truly want to follow him. They came because they wanted a simple meal. They wanted to watch him heal people or maybe hear him say some cool things. But they didn't really want to follow him. They were enjoying the show, but it was, it was too difficult to truly commit to following Jesus. And that's what Jesus is saying. You come to me, you continually come to me, and I will, I will help you. I will feed that hunger in you. And so the people began to walk away. They began to leave Jesus. And then as, as all these people who had been following Jesus leave him, he turns to his 12 disciples. And he says to them, do you want to leave me too? Are you going to walk away as well? And here, our boy Simon Peter issues one of my favorite things. He says this. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. I keep going back to that in my life. Like, Lord, to whom shall we go? Like, I think about the times I just want to walk away. Like, following Jesus is too hard. It's, it's easy just to kind of go out and, and just munch on and just eat all this junk food instead of really coming to the bread of life, to, to spend my days just 
enjoying the Netflix and, and just sitting back and not worrying about life. But Jesus, but then I think about what Paul or Peter says, to whom shall we go? Where else am I going to go? Where else can we go? Only Jesus has the words of eternal life. Only he is the one that will satisfy that hunger inside us. Jesus is the true bread. He is that bread of life. And only that bread has the words of eternal life. Only that bread of Jesus can nourish and satisfy our souls. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. As we are going to sing our final song, it's called Break Thou the Bread of Life. And as we sing that song, I'm going to invite you, whoever wants to, you don't have to, but invite you to come forward. And just as you come forward, you can rip off a piece of this bread, any bread you want. Just kind of come up here, grab a chunk of bread, and take it back with you. Enjoy it. Just uh, use it as, a, as you come forward. Think about it as Jesus is saying, come to me. Keep coming. Continually come, and you will never go hungry. So as we sing this song, I invite you just to come forward. You don't have to, but if you want to picture yourself coming to Jesus. And then I want you to think about this throughout this week. As you make a sandwich, as you pull out a piece of bread, if you're eating something, just be remembering of that. Remember Jesus who offered himself, who is the true bread of life. And he will satisfy. When you are to come to Jesus, to keep coming to Jesus, the bread of heaven, the bread of life, that will never leave you hungry.